Last week we left the disciples in the upper room. We suggested that it was probably one of the rooms in the temple in as much as Luke tells us that after Jesus ascended, they were daily in the temple praising God. Now we come to verse 15, chapter 1 of the book of Acts. And in those days, that is the seven days that they were there in the temple or there in the upper room, praying, praising God, worshiping the Lord, and waiting, as Jesus told them to do, for the promise of the Father, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. It is interesting to me that God's timing is always perfect. They were waiting for the promise of the Messiah. In our lesson next week, we will see that that promise of Jesus, that the Holy Spirit was going to baptize them, was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. And so the timing of God, they're waiting. They're waiting for the promise of God. It seems to me that waiting upon God is a great exercise of faith. And many of us have failed in that particular test. We so often move out in our own energy, in our own strength. We so often decide to take things in our own hands. We have our own scheming, our own devices. We would love to manipulate things. We would love to put things together rather than wait upon God to do it. We so often are wanting to go out and defend ourselves against scurrilous types of attacks. And I've always discovered if I seek to defend myself, the Lord will let me. <laughs> but it's always a very poor defense. But if I let the Lord defend me, if I wait upon him and let him defend me, he does such a masterful job. I don't know why I try when he can do such a magnificent job of defending. Why should I get in the way? We find that Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Peter seemed to be sort of a natural leader. But we see him here perfectly restored now in fellowship with the Lord. He had denied the Lord under tremendous pressure. He'll have the opportunity to take that test again. He will be in a similar situation and the same kind of pressure will be put upon him, but this time he'll come through with flying colors. Jesus had told Peter that Satan desired him. He wanted to sift him like wheat. But Jesus assured him, I've prayed for you. And when you are converted... Strengthen your brethren. We now see him in the position, the, the position of strengthening the brethren. Taking a role of leadership within the church. But surely not as a pope. We find that when the first church council was called in the 15th chapter of Acts... Peter did not act as the 
final authority within the church or as the Pope with papal decrees. But Peter was only a witness of what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And it appears that James was actually the one who made the decision that the church all agreed upon. And Paul tells us that when Peter came to Antioch, that he caused a dissension in the church. But for because when certain brethren had come down, he had been eating with the Gentiles. But when certain brethren came down from the church in Jerusalem, he separated himself and was eating only with the Jews. And so Paul said, I withstood him to the face because he was at fault. Paul rebuked him openly. I don't think that a cardinal or a bishop would do that to the Pope. And so the idea that Peter was the first Pope is an invention of the Roman Catholic Church and surely not a biblical kind of a doctrine or even suggested in the Bible. We read that Peter stood up in the midst of them and the number was about 120. Now, of the many disciples, Jesus told, chose 12 of them to be called apostles. But there were a numberless or a great number of people who were disciples of Jesus and followed Jesus from the beginning, from his baptism by John, right on up to the ascension into heaven, uh, there were many disciples. There are 120 that are here now waiting for the promise of the Father in the upper room there in Jerusalem. The number 12, of course, he called 12 to be an apostles. The number 12 seems to be an interesting biblical number that deals with human government. Ishmael, the son of Abraham, had 12 sons who became 12 princes over the descendants of Ishmael. There were 12 sons of Jacob who became the 12 tribes of Israel. When David organized the worship teams to lead the worship in the temple, there were 24 groups of 12 that were uh, brought together for the worship there in the temple. 24, of course, twice 12, and 12 in each group. And of course, then the 12 apostles. Jesus chose 12 of them to be apostles. And so Peter stood up in the midst and he said, Men and brethren, the scripture must needs be fulfilled. They referred to the Old Testament as the scriptures. Our Old Testament that we have in our Bible is the very same scriptures that the Jews used in the days of Jesus and called them and counted them as scriptures. Our Old Testament is the same as theirs. The same recognized books. We call it the canon, the Old Testament canon. Uh, the canon comes from the word that means ruler. And so sort of a guide. These are those that are recognized as inspired by God. They were recognized by the Jews at the time of Christ. They were recognized by Jesus. He spoke often of the scriptures. And in the New Testament, there are over 300 quotations from these scriptures. There is only one quotation from the book of Enoch, uh, in Jude that does not that is not comprised in what was commonly 
accepted by the Jews as the scriptures in the time of Christ. Josephus, who was born in 37 AD, shortly after the death of Christ, and became a great historian. Uh, The works of Josephus are classic as far as giving us a history of the events. Well, uh, he goes way back in the Jewish history, but he brings us up to the events, uh, to the fall of Jerusalem uh, under the Roman legions, under Titus, the Roman general. And Josephus declares that there were 22 books that the Jews believed were divine. And the reason why he said 22 is that many of the books that he listed are combined, such as Ezra and Nehemiah are combined as one book. And several books were combined as one to make the 39 that we have into 22. Uh, First and second kings were just uh, brought together as kings. Chronicles the same. Samuel the same. And several of the books were brought and grouped together as one uh, because he wanted one book for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But they are all the same books that we have in our Old Testament today and were recognized as scriptures and were read in the synagogue on every Sabbath day during the time that Jesus was here on earth. Now, the Bible purports to be God's inspired word. Peter here tells us, or he declares to these people, Peter stood up in the midst, and he said, Men and brethren, the scripture referring to the same Old Testament we have, must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of David, spake before, the com- spake before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. Notice that he said that the Holy Spirit had spoken through David. David himself declared that his writings were guided by the Holy Spirit. He declares in 2 Samuel that his words, the Spirit of the Lord, he said, spake by me, And his word was in my tongue. Quite a claim. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me. 2 Samuel 23, 2. Now, Jesus confirmed this claim of David. In Mark 12, 36, Jesus said, For David himself said by the Holy Spirit. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. So here Peter is telling us that David was speaking by the Holy Spirit when he declared uh, these prophecies concerning Judas. Now, if this is God's divinely inspired word, then of necessity it must be inerrant, without error. And thus we have place our faith in the Bible as God's inspired, inerrant word. When Jesus warned about the false prophets, he, in the context, spoke about two men who built houses. One built upon the sand, and the other dug deep and laid his foundation upon the rock. And when the storms came, the house that was built upon the sand fell because it lacked a solid foundation. God's word, the Bible, is a solid foundation 
upon which we build our house of faith. If you build it upon experience, you're building upon sand. If you're be building your house of faith on some feeling that you had, you're building on sand. As we sing, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in His excellent Word. God's Word, the Bible, is the final authority for all of our belief, for all of our faith, and for all of our practices. God has given to us all that is necessary for a life of godliness through His Word, exceeding rich and precious promises that by these we become partakers of the divine nature. And because the Bible is the foundation for our faith and practice, it is Satan's primary and chief target. In the Garden of Eden, the first thing that Satan did was question the Word of God to Eve. Hath God said? If Satan can destroy the foundation, then the house will surely fall. And the moment you begin to compromise in the least, the fact that the Bible is inspired of God, it is God's revelation of himself. Holy men spoke as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit that all scripture is given to us by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for rebuke, for reproof. That we might be thoroughly furnished. The moment you begin to hedge on the fact that the Bible is the Word of God, it isn't long before the house will fall. Satan seeks to destroy people's confidence in the Bible as God's Word. And surely you have heard people that come and they ask questions. And the questions are designed to question whether or not it is really God's Word. When they come and they ask you a question, really the purpose is to sort of say, well, does that really make sense? You know, And uh, they're trying to destroy the foundation upon which our house of faith is built. Unfortunately, Satan has been doing a pretty thorough job in dissuading people from believing that the Bible is inerrant and that the Bible is divinely inspired. In a recent survey of ministers conducted by Jeffrey Hayden, in which 7,441 ministers were interviewed and asked to fill out a questionnaire, on the question, do you believe the scriptures are the inerrant work of God in faith, in history, and secular matters? And of the Episcopalian pastors that responded to this, to this uh, survey, 95% answered no. They did not believe the Bible was inspired and inerrant in all matters. Of the Methodists, 87% responded no. Of the Presbyterians, 82% responded no. Of the American Lutherans, 77% responded no. And of the American Baptist, 67% answered no. Now once you lose the foundation, it is only a matter of time until the whole house collapse. And thus we see these denominations collapsing. We see them losing membership every year as the people die off. They're really not gaining too many new members uh, and the older ones are dying off. And thus we see a diminishing number. Why? Because if you don't believe that the Bible is 
God's word, divinely inspired and inerrant, you don't bother teaching the Bible. You will teach on other subjects. Uh, you'll become a lecturer in sociology and how to get along and uh, how to be a good neighbor. Or you'll have lectures on honesty in business and how to be prosperous in business and how to operate a good business. And it's interesting when you look at the titles of the messages in so many of the pulpits across America today. They're not really Bible-centered. Satan has destroyed the foundation by bringing into a person's mind a question as to whether or not the Bible is indeed God's inspired word. But here Peter declares it. The scripture must be fulfilled. If it's scripture, yes, it has to be fulfilled. It's inerrant which was spoken by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David, recognizing the inspiration from God coming through man and thus inerrant. Now here's what Peter had to say concerning Judas. He said that he was a guide to those who arrested Jesus. We know from the scriptures that Judas went to the chief priest and struck a deal with them. They were anxious to arrest Jesus. But because of the popular public following, they were fearful to do it openly in public. They wanted to do it secretly and to get the trial with before the people really knew what was going on. And so Judas came and bargained with them. According to the scriptures, for 30 pieces of silver to show them where they could find Jesus at night, free from the crowds, where they could arrest him, try him, and get him on the cross before the general populace even knew what was going on. And thus, as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, a spot that he often went to with his disciples, and as he had commanded them to pray, Judas came into the garden, bringing the soldiers with him, and they arrested Jesus and had the midnight trial which was totally illegal. In the morning, they brought him to Pilate because they wanted the death sentence to be pronounced. Death by crucifixion. And so, Peter tells us of Judas that he led those who uh, he was a guide to those who arrested Jesus. The second thing he tells us that he was numbered among us. He was one of those that Jesus called to be an apostle. Jesus, of course, had made mention of that. Uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. But Peter says he had obtained a part of this ministry. When the 70 were sent out to minister, Judas was one of those who went out. They went out two by two. You wonder who the partner was that Judas had. But he was numbered with them in the ministry and obtained a part of the ministry. But then he tells us that he purchased a field with the reward of iniquity. Now, Judas didn't actually purchase the field what it is actually saying is that the money that belonged to Judas was used to purchase the field. He had made a deal that he would betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Many question the motive of Judas. There are many who feel that he was ambitious for the kingdom of heaven to be established 
He had been the treasurer of the group. He had been thieving from the purse. But he was hoping that when Jesus set up the kingdom that he could have a prominent position. And he was sort of tired of waiting and thus thought he would force the issue by leading the people to arrest Jesus, figuring that Jesus would then manifest his power and uh, people would then recognize that he was the Messiah and he would set up the kingdom. Now that is what people imagined that his motives were. Just what the motives were, we don't know. But people imagine that that possibly is one of the motives of Judas trying to force Jesus to uh, present himself as the Messiah and uh, by his exercise of supernatural powers. And that when Jesus submitted to the authorities... When Jesus was crucified, he then realized what a horrible thing he had done. We do know that he brought the money back to the chief priest and asked them to take the money back. That he was guilty of betraying innocent blood. And they said, that's your problem. And he threw the money down there in front of them and he left. And it became their problem. It was blood money. It was used to purchase a man's life. Thus it could not be returned to the temple treasury. And thus because it belonged to Judas they decided to buy a potter's field with that money. And that is why it said Judas purchased the field. Uh, and it, be, it was because it was the money that belonged to Judas that was used in the purchasing of the field. Peter tells us that falling headlong, he burst asunder, all of his bowels gushed out. Now, some see a contradiction here with the Gospels that tell us that he went out and hung himself. No contradiction. Possibly what happened is he climbed up the tree, out on the limb, tied the rope around the uh, limb, and then dove off or jumped off. As his neck was snapped, the rope possibly broke. He fell on down under the sharp rocks below and his body burst open. And so both accounts surely are uh, reconcilable. He tells us that Judas, by transgression, fell fell from the grace of God and he went to his own place a polite way of saying he went to hell Jesus speaking of Judas in Matthew 26:24 said the son of man goes as it is written of him but woe unto that man by whom the son of man is betrayed it had been good for that man if he had not been born. Only one that we read of in the scripture where Jesus said it would be better off if we were never born. And that's Judas Iscariot. Jesus called him the son of perdition. Jesus in John 6, 70 said to his disciples... Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? In John thirteen eighteen, Jesus said, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eats bread with me hath, has lifted up his heel against me. 
And so he knew exactly what Judas was going to do from the beginning. The scriptures speaking of Judas, here Peter quotes from the Old Testament. He quotes from Psalm 69. Now in looking at the 69th chapter, verse 25, it says, Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. Now, if you just read that scripture out of context, you wonder how in the world can Peter interpret that as being a reference to Judas Iscariot. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. And then he put that together with Psalm 105 and let another take his bishopric. And in just reading the scriptures separately apart from their context, it's difficult to see how Peter could at all say that this was a reference to Judas Iscariot. But if you read the scriptures in their context, you will find that these are what are called the Messianic Psalms, as we read Psalm 22 tonight. These also are psalms that refer to Jesus and they refer to his crucifixion. Beginning with verse 19 of Psalm 69, Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before thee. And this is a prophecy of Jesus and the thoughts of Jesus. Reproach has broken my heart. I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So we immediately recognize that this is Jesus and the thoughts of Jesus on the cross. Let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the grief of those who whom thou hast wounded. Let their habitation be desolate, and let none dwell in their tents. Uh, add iniquity to their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. And then in Psalm 109, For my love, another one of Jesus from the cross, For my love they are my adversaries. Jesus is saying, I love them, but they've become enemies. But I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. And when he shall be judged, let him be condemned, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children can be continually vagabonds and beg, and let them... Uh, Seek, and my computer didn't get the rest of that one. Uh, so, when the computer fails, you turn back to Psalm 109 and uh, read it out of the book. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg, and let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. And so, uh, the Peter is saying that these scriptures are a reference to Judas. That we need to choose someone to take the place of Judas among the twelve. The scripture must be fulfilled. Let his habitation be desolate and let another take his bishopric. So taking 
those two phrases out of these messianic psalms. Now notice the requirements they had for apostles. We need to choose one who has accompanied with us all of the time that the Lord went in and out among us from the time that he was baptized by John and continued with us till his ascension. So there were others beside the twelve who had been with Jesus the entire time of his earthly ministry, from his baptism to his ascension. And we need one who can bear witness of his resurrection. That is, they have seen the risen Lord. They need to be able to bear a witness to having seen the risen Lord. Now when Paul is affirming his apostleship, he said, Are not the signs of an apostle wrought by me? So it would seem that, again, there had to be miraculous supernatural works wrought through their lives. And Paul is making reference to the miracles that were wrought through his life. The works of the apostles were wrought by me. And he declares that he had seen the risen Lord. So he also made claim to be an, being an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So Peter says we need to choose one. The scripture must needs be fulfilled. I think that Peter possibly is guilty here of what we often many times ourselves are guilty of. And that is knowing what the Lord wants, feeling that somehow we are responsible of implementing it. In other words, we need to choose one. Rather than because it is scripture, God's going to do it. He can do it in his way, in his time. And I question the way that Peter did it. And we read they appointed two. Now, first of all, I believe that it is not wise to give God just two options. And I think that many times we are guilty of that. Lord, do you want us to do this or to do that? Well, maybe he doesn't want us to do either. Or maybe it's something entirely different. And giving limited options to God, I think, is a mistake. When I come, I want to be totally open. All options open, Lord. Do it as you please. Do as you know best. And I never, I try never to give God limited options, but to leave it completely open. So they appointed two. And then they asked, which of the two have you chosen? What if it were neither of the two? They've not made that option. And it says they gave forth their lots. It was sort of a drawing of straws. I suggest that this isn't probably a good way of discerning the will of God. Lord, do you want me to go to Knott's Berry Farm or Disneyland? <laughs> the long straw is Knott's Berry Farm and the short one is Disneyland. And I don't know that that is the best way to discern the Lord's will. It was an Old Testament method of discerning the will of the Lord. When on the Day of Atonement they had the two goats, one was to be 
uh, slain as a sin offering, and the other was to be set loose in the wilderness. The priest would cast lots to determine which of the goats would be slain for the sacrifice. When the children of Israel came into the promised land, and they were had made the survey of the land, and had divided the land into 12 uh, areas, Joshua cast lots to see which tribe would get which section of the land. And so the land was apportioned by the casting of lots. The priestly duties were determined by the casting of lots. And in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verse 9, the father of John the Baptist was a priest. His name was Zacharias. And we read, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot, that is, the lots were cast, and it became his lot to burn the incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So it was an Old Testament method of discerning God's will, this casting of lots. Interestingly enough, of course, the um, soldiers cast lots concerning uh, the robe that Jesus wore, who would get it because uh, they didn't want to tear it into four pieces. Now, the lot fell on Matthias. It's interesting that after this, there is no mention of Matthias at all in the book of Acts or in the New Testament. It is, that's about all we know about Matthias. This is about the only time his name ever appears in the Bible. And it's when they cast the lots and it fell on Matthias. If you read Fox's Book of Martyrs or Eusebius's uh, church history book, they will both declare that very little is known of Matthias, probably less than any of the apostles. According to tradition, he was stoned to death in Jerusalem, and after he died, they beheaded him. But uh, as far as the Bible is concerned, there is nothing more said of Matthias, what his ministry was or, or whatever. But he was numbered then with the twelve. Now, it is important to note that this is the last time they ever sought to know the will of God by the casting of lots. After the Holy Spirit had come upon the church, it seems that the church was more directed through the gift of prophecy than the casting of lots. That there was God speaking through the gift of prophecy and directing the activities of the church. You remember in the 13th chapter that there were certain prophets in the church of Antioch, Barnabas, Saul, and others. And the Holy Spirit spake and said, Separate unto me Saul and Barnabas for the ministry wherein I have called them. And so there was a definite word of the Holy Spirit through prophecy that directed them. When Paul was returning to Jerusalem with an offering for the poor church from uh, being among the Gentile churches collecting the offering, when he was at Caesarea, one of the prophets in the church in Jerusalem, Agabus by name, came down to Caesarea, took Paul's belt or girdle and bound himself with it and said, Thus is the man who owns this girdle to be bound when he gets to Jerusalem. 
Agabus, we are told, also prophesied of a certain famine that would come. Paul the Apostle encourages Timothy to stir up the gifts that were with him, within him that were given in, unto him by the laying on of hands of the presbytery and by prophecy. So when they laid hands on him and prayed for him, there was a prophecy that directed him concerning the gifts that God would bestow upon him. And Paul is encouraging him to stir up those gifts. So once the Holy Spirit was given to the church, it seems that uh, they didn't trust to sort of a luck kind of thing, casting of lots, but they look to the direct guidance from the Holy Spirit. And as we go through the book of Acts, we'll find the place of the Holy Spirit in the directing of the activities of the church. Today it is our heart's desire and our heart's prayer that the church be directed and guided by the Holy Spirit. As we gather together for the board meetings, we begin with prayer. And we have a time of prayer together after which we then conduct the business of the church. But in our prayers, there is always that acknowledgement that Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And that we are only there to hear from him and to be guided by him. And that our decisions would represent his desires and his will. That there would be a divorcing of any personal desires that we might submit fully and completely to what the Lord desires for his church, recognizing it is his church and he is the Lord over the church. And it's wonderful to work with men who have been called of God to pray together and together seek the will of God for the direction for the church and for the future. And I count it a wonderful privilege to have these men standing with us, praying with us. I feel blessed as Saul, there went with him a company of men whose hearts God had touched. Men who are wanting God's will for the church and are seeking it through prayer and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so it seemed it was in the early church that that's the way it operated. No more casting of lots, but now receiving directions from the Holy Spirit as to the direction the church should take. Father, we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit within the church. And Lord, we thank you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit and for the way, Lord, that you have directed the church by these supernatural gifts. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to be in charge as you, Lord, direct the mission of the church. And Lord, we do pray that we will become an expression of your will. In Jesus' name, amen.